because we get we get uh, people joining um, up until a few minutes after nine. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us this morning for what I think is going to be a really interesting talk um, about Lake Superior warming um, today. Um, with a number of people I see in the participant list that I think may be new to us, just a point of introduction for us for ourselves. I'm Mark Ferrey, and I join um, Brooke Asleyson and and Katie Grant in arranging bi-monthly seminars on water issues for the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. If you have ideas that you think would be interesting to hear about and that would interest our group, send them on. We are always looking for ideas for our talks. This morning, um, like I said, it is a real pleasure to welcome Jay Austin to our seminar uh, series. Um, Jay is... Uh, a professor at the uh, University of Minnesota Duluth, where he writes in his uh, bio that he has wide ranging interests across a broad range of temporal and spatial scales, including winter structure and processes, the role of ice, uh, springtime convection, and the response of large lakes to climate change, which uh, forms the uh, basis of his, um, of his talk today. He says, you know, lakes are among the sentinel systems that provide us with insight and evidence of the geographic distribution of our global warming. But with the year-to-year -year variability, it makes it difficult to tease out those trends. And Lake Superior, with its particularly long data sets, gives us the, uh, gives us the opportunity to say something about that warming um, on a long-term um, long scale. Jay has his uh, training in math and physics and did graduate work in the joint program in physical oceanography at MIT and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Jay, it is a pleasure to have you uh, with us um, this morning. Please um, take it away. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, and the other co-conveners. I really appreciate um, the honor of, of having the opportunity to speak with you a little bit today. Um, as, as Mark said, my background is actually in oceanography. I moved here to Duluth um, in 2005 um, to take a faculty position at UMD. Um, I, am, I hold joint appointments in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and a group called the Large Lakes Observatory. And I'm going to take just a minute or two um, before I get into the sort of meat of the talk to talk a little bit about some of the affiliations that I have here. So that people are aware of some of the programs that are going on at UMD and in the University of Minnesota system um, as a whole. Um, so I mentioned, let me go forward. There it is. Um, that I'm part of the Large Lakes Observatory. Um, <clears throat> it's a group of faculty on the UMD campus that have um, specific interests in understanding the underpinnings of how large lakes around the world work. And so we're not the Lake Superior Observatory or even the Great Lakes Observatory, um, we look at large lakes around the world. And so we frequently have um, field work um, in the um, African uh, rift lakes. Um, one uh, faculty member uh, is studying the geochemistry of uh, deep lakes in Indonesia. Um, we have drilling projects in Mexico. So there's a very wide range uh, globally, uh, global reach of the work that we do. Um, the faculty members, We'll have a halftime appointment at LLO, as we call it, and then uh, one of the traditional departments on campus. So I'm associated with the physics department, but we also have people that are joint with geology, which is now earth and environmental sciences, um, biology and chemistry. Um, and while there's a tremendously wide range of interests across the faculty, there really is sort of a common interest in climate and how it influences lakes. Um, people like myself, we study modern climate, and so I'm going out and making direct observations of the lake, um, trying to understand how it works. But we also have a group of people who spend a lot of time looking at sediment cores and trying to infer things about uh, paleoclimate, past climate, um, by looking at the sediment from the bottom of lakes, which acts sort of as a tape recorder over time. Um, I'm also the uh, director of graduate studies for a program called Water Resources Science. Um, this is a joint program between the um, between the Twin Cities campus and the Duluth campus. And so I have a co-director of graduate studies down in the Twin Cities, uh, Diana Kerwin. Um, 
we have a large number of faculty from many, many departments on two campuses. Um, we award both masters and PhD um, uh, degrees to students. And actually two thirds of the students are up here at UMD and the other third is down in the Twin Cities. Um, I'll mention really quickly that we have one of our courses that is a sort of a, a practicum where we bring in people from government and industry, um, in government or industrial organizations, and they pose problems for the students to work on. And so they'll do a project over the course of a semester. And if that sounds like something that people at the MPCA might be interested in, you have questions you think that a, a group of really bright students um, could tackle, um, please get in touch with me and I'm happy to discuss that. Um, I don't actually teach that particular course, but um, I will get you in touch with the person that does. Um, my work, I'm primarily an observationalist. So I go out on boats and I put stuff in the water and I leave it there for months uh, at a time. And then I come back and hopefully get it back. Um, and we use that sort of thing. Uh, um, long term data sets to understand how these lakes are behaving. Um, you can see pictures here. Um, there is very heavy student involvement in all this sort of stuff. Um, they, the pictures here are on the deck of the Blue Heron, which is the research vessel that the University of Minnesota operates. Um, as Mark mentioned in the introduction, um, I work on a, a very broad range of, of problems. Uh, today, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, climate change and winter conditions, ice and thermal structure. Um, but I've, I've been, the, the windmill I've been tilting at for the last five years is actually understanding springtime convection, which is a really interesting and difficult problem. Um, I'm also interested in physical biological interactions, and I have sort of a, a side gig um, looking at uh, natural acoustics in large lakes. What I'm going to talk about today, um, I want to, I, this occurs to me that it's a little bit about, out of order. Um, I'm going to start by talking about, um, talking about sort of global response of lakes to climate change, but then I want to focus down on Lake Superior as a case study, primarily because it's here, and I'm looking out the window at a largely ice-free Lake Superior right now in early to mid-February, which is a little bit distressing. Um, um, so I want to spend some time focusing on um, some data we have from Lake Superior. Almost everything in this talk is in the public domain. In other words, um, this particular talk doesn't include a lot of my own personal observations. It's mostly me um, exploiting data available from agencies like NOAA or the EPA. Um, and a point that I want to make here is that um, even small changes in things like uh, temperature or ice cover have significant ecological, uh, commercial, recreational, and cultural impacts. Um, and so one, one thing I want you to take home from this is that Lake Superior, for all its enormous size, is extraordinarily sensitive to even small changes in climate. Um, I'm just going to run through these really quickly. Um, I think uh, the last group I gave a, this talk to was much more geographically uh, diverse, um, but just some, some facts about Lake Superior itself really quickly. Um, largest lake by surface area in the world, 10% of the world's freshwater, roughly half of the surface freshwater in the US, um, very low population density um, given its size. It's about 1% of the total Great Lakes region. Um, you can take four major metropolitan areas and come up with almost half of the population within the Great Lakes Basin. Um, very low um, uh, productivity as far as fisheries. Um, very, very large um, amount of shipping on the lake. Um, four billion uh, in tourism per year, uh, dollars that is. Um, relatively low agricultural pressure within the watershed, um, although that is slowly changing. Um, and not a huge amount of power generation um, uh, in, in the basin. A uh, recent report, um, the EPA and Environment Climate Change Canada put out a report uh, every three years, the state of the Great Lakes. Um, I've been the chapter lead for water temperature for the last several iterations of that. Um, and I always find this sort of a, a difficult or maybe sort of a rum exercise is they 
they want to put a a label on each one of the lakes about its status, which is an ex extraordinarily broad, um, difficult thing to do. Um, but Lake Superior is largely considered to be um, its ecosystem to be in relatively good shape um, and um, unchanging uh, relative to the other lakes. Um, a similar uh, exercise um, was done a, a decade ago now, um, looking at um, multiple stressors um, and coming up with some way of, of, of distilling that down to a single number. And what they find is that largely um, compared to the other Great Lakes, um, Lake Superior is under less stress than the others. At the same time, uh, some of the fastest warming that we uh, anticipate in the Great Lakes um, is occurring in, in Lake Superior. So on the left here, these are trends in ice cover duration um, over the last um, uh, the period of record at the time th that this paper was written. Um, so over a 40 year time span, um, some of the greater um, trends in ice duration are in Lake Superior. In other words, su significantly shorter seasons. And then in summer warming, especially the Eastern Basin of Lake Superior, um, we expect to see uh, getting uh, getting warmer over time, or that we've observed getting warmer over time. Sorry. Um, some direct data. Um, this is the um, this is the power plant at the, at the Sioux Locks, um, and so this uh, power plant generates power to to operate the locks. Um, and interestingly, um, water temperature has been recorded at this site. Once a day since 1906, um, and for for whatever engineering purpose, um, and those records um, are available. And if you look at the summer water temperature from that site, um, we see a um, a pattern that is um, relatively familiar with with some warming in the first half of the 20th century and things really taking off after about 1980. What's interesting about that is that if you compare this to um, the global uh, average uh, air temperature, the I've 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 scaled the vertical axis to be the same on both of these, or the the, the spacing to be the same. And what you can see is that uh, Lake Superior is actually warming significantly faster than uh, global averages would su would suggest. Now, this is largely in line with our understanding of the geographic distribution of warming in that mid to high latitude sites and mid continent sites tend to have uh, are predicted to have higher rates of warming. Um, another long term time series um, from Lake Superior. Um, I, I throw I, I actually really like this example, um, although it might be a little bit difficult to um, uh, to replicate in other places. There's a ferry that runs from Bayfield to La Pointe um, in the Apostle Islands, um, and that ferry has to stop operating in the winter. Um, a high school student named Forrest Houck um, in 2009 dug through a bunch of old newspaper records and determined when the first boat of the season um, started um, operating and when the last boat uh, stopped operating um, uh, in the in the fall and found significant trends towards um, a longer open water season, at least at this particular site um, in Western Superior. Um, broadening out to the global scale, this is from a paper um, by Catherine O'Reilly um, and 75 co-authors, including myself, um, looking at warming rates of lakes around the world. And so basically what happened is they, they locked, the 75 of us in a room in Lincoln, Nebraska for three days um, to argue about how to objectively and consistently uh, compare rates of warming in lakes around the world with very disparate data sets. And so up until this point, a lot of people had anecdotal data or data from their particular um, system that they study. And so I was sort of the point person for the Laurentian Great Lakes on this. But there are lots and lots of people who do this for their um, for their particular lake or system of lakes. Um, and when we did that analysis, what we found was that mid-continent lakes and mid to high latitude lakes tended to have their highest rates of warming. And so the Laurentian Great Lakes 
and then lakes in northern Europe um, had the um, the highest rates of warming from this globally distributed data set. Um, a um, excuse me. Uh, an exercise by John Magnuson, who's at the university, or was he's emeritus at the University of Wisconsin Madison, um, looking at records of lake freeze up and break up dates, or lake and river freeze up and break up dates around the world, um, showed in fact that um, freezing is occurring later and um, thawing is occurring earlier in in a wide range of systems around the globe. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about this particular graph, especially if you look at the, the axis on the um, on the graph on the right here, um, these are lakes in Japan. Um, and some of these records, Lake Sua, for instance, goes back to uh, the 1400s. And I'm not sure how much um, weight I would put on this as far as reliability, um, but I think what's interesting is it it really illustrates, I think, the cultural impact um, that lakes have, and the fact that lake ice is something that people on a global basis pay a lot of attention to. So um, make of make of the graphs on the right what you will, but we do find this consistent um, trend towards uh, less lake ice, especially in the latter half of the 20th century. Okay, um, I want to turn to Lake Superior um, as my sort of case. Um, uh, my case example here. Um, this is from a really nicely written thesis um, by Dan Tietze, um, a PhD student of mine um, uh, several years ago now, now that I think about it. And in the top panel, um, he is showing, um, he came into my office once with this, with this graph, um, looking at, um, uh, sort of the regional air temperature average um, over the last, well, the time, 45 years or so. Um, and on the bottom, the seasonally averaged ice cover on Lake Superior. And I looked at this and they almost look like mirror images to me. Um, and I was like, Dan, why don't you go plot one against the other instead of plotting them as time series? Um, and he did that. Um, is this going forward now? Technical issues here. There we go. And he came back with this. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you an updated version of this in a few slides. But this is it, when people ask. Some, sometimes you have to give a lightning talk, and they say you get to have one slide. Actually, the next slide, but very similar to this. I want to talk about this for just a little bit. Um, on the horizontal axis here is the um, average winter air temperature. So averaging air temperature from December through May. And on the vertical axis is the average amount of ice cover on Lake Superior um, from December through May as well. Um, there, there are a number. The, the first thing is that this relationship is unbelievably tight. Um, lake ice formation is a really complex process, but what this says is that if you tell me the average air temperature, I can tell you how much ice is going to be. And while that doesn't seem like rocket science, the fact that it doesn't depend on whether it was a windy winter. It doesn't depend on how much precipitation. It doesn't depend on whether the previous summer was warm or cold. Air temperature is the is the only game in town. Uh, I think that's really really interesting and still something that I think is not as well understood as could be. The second thing I'd like to point out here is that there's a huge amount of variability. 2014, um, that was the polar vortex year. That if, if you were living in the upper Midwest, you remember that um, you remember that winter by far. Um, the highest ice coverage and by far the coldest. And then 2012, just two years earlier, um, we have um, the warmest and most ice free uh, winter that we've had the entire time of uh, the period of record here. Um, the other thing that I like to point out can people see the cursor that I'm moving around? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, these here, are years with little to no open lake ice. And so you might be getting ice in fringing bays um, or very close to the coast, but basically there's no open lake ice in years like this. These right here, or these, are years with significant open lake ice where people are visiting the ice caves near Bayfield or 
they're ice fishing out of Duluth, and maybe the shipping season is impacted. The difference in winter air temperature between these basically ice free years and these ice heavy years is two degrees Celsius. Um, and so one of the problems we have with trying to communicate climate change is that the changes we talk about sound really small. It's going to be a degree warmer, two degrees warmer by the end of the century. And it's really easy, I would think, as a layperson to just dismiss that um, because it was 10 degrees colder yesterday and it's going to be five degrees warmer tomorrow. Why do I care about it being a couple degrees warmer by the end of the century? And the answer is stuff like this, where we have this extremely sensitive dependence of ice formation on, on air temperature. Um, Dan extended that um, to the other Great Lakes. Um, and so here um, I show the ice coverage and air temperature from um, all five lakes. And, and the details of this are a bit complicated, but the, the story remains the same. We see the same basic sensitivity to um, air temperature on all the lakes. Um, and there is a bit of an offset. Um, there, the offset here is almost entirely a function of the depth of the lake. So Superior, um, by virtue of its great depth, um, doesn't freeze um, as readily as Erie, which although it's in a warmer climate, um, uh, forms more ice simply because it's so shallow. Um, we can look at ice coverage data from Lake Superior. Um, and so uh, 2014, um, the polar vortex year, basically um, ice covered um, around mid-February. Um, 2017, uh, in contrast, just a few years later, um, uh, relatively ice-free. Um, I have this year's. Um, so 2012 is sort of the canonical um, ice free year. Um, and then 2023, the year that we're having right now, um, again, getting a lot of attention in the press um, over the relative lack of ice. And so, again, in, in, in Whitefish Bay and in Thunder Bay um, and, and the further in bays, there is some fast ice. There's a little bit of ice along the South Shore and in the um, Apostles Archipelago. Um, but the open lake is basically um, ice free this year. I said I was going to update. Um, so here is um, a graph of this is basically the same graph that Dan had um, with air temperature down here and ice cover here. Again, through 2022, we don't have enough data this year um, yet to put a dot on the graph. We're going to be somewhere in this cluster right here um, by the end of the season, I predict. Um, but again, we see this extremely strong dependence on. Um, on winter air temperature. You might say, well, that's fine. And it tells us a little bit about ice, um, but, but so what? Um, the so what is that it turns out that um, winter conditions actually precondition the lake for what happens later in the season. And so um, I can extend this. Now um, I'm showing the average ice cover on the, on the horizontal axis here and summer water temperatures. And again, you see a relatively strong relationship. Low ice cover years tend to be followed by summers with relatively high water temperatures and vice versa. High ice cover years um, tend to delay the onset of stratification in the lake and result in cooler, um, um, cooler um, summer water temperatures the following summer. I can go one step further than that. And this, I think, is really um, oops, a little too far. Um, really astounding in that average winter air temperature is actually a very strong predictor of summer water temperature. So cold winters tend to be followed by cold summer water temperatures and warm winters are followed by um, warm uh, uh, summer uh, temperatures. Uh, you'll notice that on, on the last series of graphs, I've, I've separated um, things pre-1998 from things um, from 1998 to the present. Um, and what you'll notice in that all of these, let's go back to this one, the red dots are more predominantly over here and the green dots more predominantly over here. Um, so I was curious about what was driving that. Um, and so here, 
um, this is a graph <clears throat> from of air temperature at the Duluth airport. Um, and these are averages of December through January. So winter air temperatures um, from 1949 to the present. Um, and so uh, the, the air temperature meteorological data is, is publicly available. And I've, I've drawn a, a vertical line at 1998. And then I've somewhat arbitrarily drawn lines at minus eight degrees and minus 12 degrees Celsius um, average air temperature. And what I want you to see is that prior to 1998, there were lots of winters that had air temperatures lower than, than minus 12. Again, an arbitrary uh, boundary. Um, and then only two, 2009 and 2014 are polar vortex winter. Polar winters like 2014 were actually pretty common. Um, you know, one in every five or something like that before, uh, before 1998, and they basically are not occurring anymore. Conversely, there are lots of winters with air temperatures above minus eight since 1998, and basically none before that. And so um, this was pointed out several years ago by a graduate student, uh, Katie Van Cleve, um, and her co-authors um, in a paper that looked did what's called a breakpoint analysis, looking for these sort of breakpoints in meteorological records. And 1998 keeps coming up um, as a significant break um, in meteorological forcing um, uh, in the Great Lakes Basin. And the consequence of that is that if if ice formation, for instance, and summer conditions are dependent on air temperature, so strongly dependent on air temperature, we expect to see those same breaks in lake function. And in fact, we do. Um, this is the average ice coverage um, on Lake Superior um, in two different periods from 1973 to 1997. Um, and, uh, and then the, the, um, period after that 1998 through 2022, I don't have 2023 on here because we're not finished with it yet. Um, we right now are somewhere around here. Um, so even significantly, even below the, um, the sort of modern era, um, ice coverage, you can see that there's nearly a factor of 2 difference in the amount of ice coverage prior to 1998 and since 1998. Um, we see the same. Oh, um, is there something missing here? Give me a second. Oh, it's coming up. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to do things out of order here. Here's the same analysis done for the other four lakes. Um, we do see um, significantly less ice um, since 1998, but it's not quite as dramatic um, as it is for um, Lake Superior. I'll point out that. In all of these lakes, um, uh, we see maximum ice coverage in sort of mid-February. Um, we're just about there right now, and the other four lakes are still uh, at relatively low levels of ice coverage. Um, this right here is the monthly average air temperature at the Duluth Airport. Um, and what I've done is I've taken <coughs> the monthly average of all the years um, after 1998 and subtracted off um, the average air temperature of years prior to 1998. And what we see is that in these summer months, spring and summer months, the difference between pre and post-1998 is not, it's, it's positive, but it's not particularly large. But in December and January um, and those fringing months, especially December and January, the air temperature difference is really very large. And so what we're seeing <coughs> are much warmer winters um, in, um, in the Superior Basin. Those much warmer winters are leading to significantly less ice, and that, that lower ice coverage has um, knock-on effects into, um, into the summer season. Um, this is um, from work that... Um, Actually, my my boss here at the Large Lakes Observatory, uh, Bob Sterner, um, has done. We've been seeing more and more years with um, algal blooms on the Wisconsin South Shore. Um, so, Western Lake Superior South Shore, we're seeing algal blooms near Port Wing and and um, and, and um, out towards the Apostle Islands. And one thing that he points out um, is that. They tend to occur in years 
with higher water temperatures. And that should come as no surprise, um, I think, that um, warmer years tend to um, uh, tend to result in uh, greater algal biomass. The actual drivers of these algal blooms is a an area of very active research. Um, and I think a lot of people are a bit alarmed to, to be seeing these algal blooms um, in what is traditionally considered a relatively low productivity, very cold lake. Um, the, the big question I have right now, and I'm sort of an area of active research is, why is there this great sensitivity? Um, and I, I sort of put this, you know, I don't, I don't know what, what these axes actually mean, climate and ice, but we do see, like the plots that Dan put together and that I've updated, um, that very small changes in air temperature um, result in relatively large changes in ice. Lake Superior sits somewhere on this curve, and so small changes as we move forward in a warming world, um, we're going to find ourselves um, out on this part of the curve a lot more often and up here um, with high ice years um, far less frequently now. Um, predictions for the um, for the upper Midwest um, can focus on, on on this here. Um, average temperatures are expected to be in the vicinity of um, four to five degrees uh, Fahrenheit or uh, so one and a half to two degrees Celsius. Um, and I, I don't remember on this particular graph what the time range is, but I think this is by um, by mid century. Um, and other indicators, um, we, we're not going to be seeing, we don't get a lot of days above 95 anyway, um, but um, a longer frost free season and significantly fewer uh, cooling degrees day, cooling degree days as well. Um, so some concluding remarks, I think I'm doing well for time, oh, good. Um, so, first of all, importantly, um, long term records are essential for putting current conditions into context and we have some anecdotal and some real. Um, um, long term records of, of meteorology and lake conditions um, in Lake Superior. Um, there are these really fascinating seasonal connections where. Um, uh, winter conditions are a really strong precondition for what happens the following summer. Um, and that we've seen a strong decrease in ice cover in the last few decades. Um, and that there seems to be this tipping point um, around 1998, um, which is a, another area of active research, really understanding what sort of global teleconnections people have pinned El Nino and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation on this, on this shift. Um, I haven't seen anything that I would consider really convincing at this stage. So anyway, um, I'd like to leave some time for questions here at the end. I've seen things popping up, but I haven't been able to really process them. They disappear very fast. So I want to take a little bit of time for questions here. Um, I'll quickly acknowledge um, the Great Lakes Observing System, um, which uh, sponsors a lot of the work that we do, the National Science Foundation, um, also a, a major funder. Um, I've been having a lot of fun recently um, uh, on Twitter uh, at this account, J Austin UMD. I've um, been doing a lot of little primers and SciComm stuff, science communications, um, having a lot of fun with that. So if, if these the stuff I'm talking about today is of any interest at all, I encourage you to follow me at J Austin UMD on Twitter. Um, we have a, an account that tweets out weather from our meteorology buoys. Although with the um, Twitter API going away, that might not happen this season. Um, anyway, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk with you. Um, I always find these online things a little bit unnerving because I can't, it's very difficult to read the audience when everyone's a little black box, uh, but hopefully we can have a lively discussion um, now that you'll all pop back up here. And with that, I'll take questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jay. So we do um, have some questions in the chat as well as in the Q and A. So um, you have to open up the Q and A box a stop, little bit I'm separately. Gonna stop, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think that okay, might yeah, be that, yep, that'll help you. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Here's everything. Yeah, all that goes away when you share your screen. Yes. Um, so where is the chat box? Participants chat. Um, 
so, okay, lots of stuff about snow plows. Um, <laughs> small difference. See the same thing for winter snow. Small difference in winter. Yeah, and so there are a lot. Of, so thanks to uh, Mike Trojan for that comment. Yeah, it's it's really interesting how sensitive a lot of these systems are, and I think that's something that we have to emphasize when we're trying to communicate the significance of the changes that we're seeing. Um, from John G, years particularly windy, data or thoughts on the role of wind wave development. Um, well, you know, wind just makes ice formation more difficult. Um, and so um, a, a recent paper um, by a, a PhD student, Bernie Yang, up at the University of Toronto, shows that ice formation on large lakes like Lake Superior or the other Laurentian Great Lakes is a very different process from ice formation on relatively shallow protected lakes. And the idea there is that um, Lake Superior, you have to cool the top 60, 80, 100 meters of water off to zero degrees Celsius before ice will start to form. Whereas on a shallow lake, you can have ice formation occurring basically um, as soon as you've passed below the temperature of maximum density. Um, you know, I, I walk by the lake every day um, with my dog and we, we make a note of, of, of the ice on the lake. And we've had a couple of sort of nascent ice formation um, events this, um, this winter. Um, but as soon as the ice, com or I'm sorry, as soon as the wind comes up, all of that ice just goes away. It just gets churned and mixed into um, warmer water below it. Um, are there the more pronounced air temperature differences in the calendar year, early and late in the year, was particularly impacted by the seasonal wind patterns? Oof. Um, it's a uh, so Justin, thank you for that comment. And the answer is I don't know. Um, but it's an interesting um, it's an interesting idea um, that it's again like like you suggest just a a change in in the dominant wind patterns that might be um, accounting for that. I don't, um, I don't have a quick comment. I'm afraid that's something I you'd sit down for a week or two and figure out. Um, and then Kristen, um, Lake Superior is de definitely on a different scale. Yes. Um, what could this data potentially apply to smaller lakes across the state? Yeah. So I think the answer is that. Um, Small lakes are going to be responding to air temperature as well, and we see this. Um, we see this dramatic shift in air temperature in 1998. Um, I suspect that if you started looking at um, phenology records, um, timing of ice on and ice off on smaller lakes, um, if I was a betting person, I bet there is a. I bet there is a, a significant decrease around 1998 due to that. Uh, due to that shift. Um, I I am not a um, an avid follower of the small lake literature. I would have to spend some time digging in because I'm sure that um, those sorts of phenology studies um, are are part of the small lake literature. It'd be worth looking at. Um, from Karsten, um, snow cover been factored in as a variable. Let's see. Parts of Minnesota have experienced very heavy snow. Yes, it's been a wonderful snow year up here in Duluth. That's for sure. Um, seems to have really impacted ice formation in many areas. I don't think that snow plays a huge role in ice formation. Probably more the other way around. In that, um, having an open lake um, and and you know liquid water at the surface um, is just more. Um, it it makes. Um, areas downstream of these lakes um, more prone to um, to lake effect snow, um, and so you saw that early this year in Buffalo, um, where there was an enormous lake effect um, uh, storm event where we had relatively late open water and very very cold air. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the connection the other way um, has been looked at um, in in any great detail. Um, oh, hey, Carrie. Oh, uh, privately. Well, hi, Carrie. Good to see you. Um, uh, bah, 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 bah. Thank you. Comment on other system and ecological impacts. 
Um, so th thank you, Lee. Um, so ice in general, um, plays roles. So again, you know, I, I mentioned a handful of different cultural impacts that ice has, um, with recreation and tourism. Um, you know, ice is part of what culturally makes Lake Superior Lake Superior, but um, ecologically, again, I'm not a biologist, and so I, I try to stay in my lane on this, but um, ice um, provide, coastal ice provides important refuge um, for spawning fish, um, and ice also plays a significant role in reducing surface, um, surface waves um, and um, ice cover tends to protect um, against coastal winter coastal erosion. And so there are a handful of different um, ecological impacts that th this sudden lack of ice, um, uh, how do I wanna say this? We're gonna see impacts on a lot of these different systems because of the more frequent low ice years that we're experiencing. Um, do you have any recommendations for us, our work at the MPCA? Uh, Kristen, yeah, so, I would like to have a conversation with some reps from MPCA about whether there are ways that our water resources science program could interact um, more um, robustly with, especially with that practical course that I was mentioning. Um, so I would be happy to have a, a conversation around those sorts of themes at some point. Um, from Scott to everyone, um, Lake Superior freeze again enough for wolves to get to Isle Royal? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think the answer is that um, the trends in ice that we're seeing are, are not some monotonic trend where every year is a little bit less ice than the last. We're still gonna have polar vortex years. We're still gonna have 2014 or 20, 2009 um, where um, we have good hard freezes and there will be that migratory route at that stage. They're just going to happen a lot less often. And so, you know, I, um, again, I'm not as familiar with the literature around um, uh, wolf and moose migration um, from Isle Royal, um, but it'd be interesting to see whether, um, I know that people at Michigan Tech have really, really uh, detailed records that go back a long way. It'd be interesting to see if we see those sort of same sort of breaks around 1998. Um, Have you reached out to discuss your research to folks in Lake Superior winter tourism? Um, ice fishing revenue in Thunder Bay, for instance, in decline in warm winters. Um, I, I don't know. That's a great question. I did just see yesterday um, that um, the Michigan Coast Guard um, affected two ice rescues, one in Saginaw Bay, one in Green Bay, um, where ice anglers were out there um, thinking that they were perfectly safe because they were in you know, a relatively confined area. It doesn't take much wind. Um, you, the wind comes around on you and you find yourself floating out towards the middle of the bay. Um, and so both rescues were successful, no injuries, um, but worth keeping in mind that, yeah, um, this decline in ice and decline in ice quality um, we can and will have impacts on the economies of of um, uh, of, of the region uh, because things like ice fishing is a, a part of our culture up here. Um, man, I'm not sure when I had so many questions last. Um, this is a lot of fun. Um, are you ready to work examining changes in the type of ice on Lake Superior, white versus black ice? This is a great question. And I, first of all, I don't know the answer, but it does give you an opportunity to talk about the fact that we know, we know a lot about the aerial coverage of ice on Lake Superior because we fly satellites over um, and we have analysts that sit and make maps and stuff like that. Beyond that, we just don't know a lot about ice on the Great Lakes. And the reason is that it's really logistically difficult to address. Um, and so if you're working on a small lake that freezes over, you can walk out with your auger, drill through, measure how thick the ice is, those sorts of things, um, study the type of ice and the quality of the ice. With Lake Superior or the other Great Lakes, um, 
first of all, their scale sort of precludes you walking out onto them other than, you know, the first few hundred meters or something like that. Um, and because the ice is rarely fast, it's just really not all that safe to walk out there. And so we actually don't know very much about like trends in ice thickness on the Great Lakes, which you would think would be a first order thing that we understood, but we really don't because logistically it's very difficult. Um, we probably know more. We certainly know more about Arctic ice and Arctic ice thickness than we do about ice on the Great Lakes. Um, part of the reason for that, first of all, the oceans are an extraordinarily important part of the you know, global climate system, and we spend a lot of effort studying them, especially the Arctic. Um, but we have scientific icebreakers, um, research icebreakers um, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. We don't have that uh, in the Great Lakes. We have icebreakers, but they are there to um, break ice for commercial shipping, uh, not for research. There are some minor collaborations, but um, um, not to the extent that we could do anything on a protracted basis. And questions just keep popping up here. Um, uh, hello from a WRS student. Hello. Um, working with the PCA. Uh, so our agents work on smaller Minnesota lakes. Um, Lee, I will follow this link after the talk. Um, so as not to, um, I will, I will look into this. Um, I am very interested in, um, in these sorts of records on all kinds of scales. Um, uh, Scott, have you heard of the Dutch Elfin talk speed skating race? Dutchman would rather win this race than win his medal. Um, yeah, so my, my wife did her postdoctoral work in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and so I became somewhat familiar with a lot of these sorts of things. Um, but yes, uh, canals not freezing over. There are, um, there are lots of examples of um, cultural interaction with lakes. And so my favorite example here um, is um, a procession called the Siegfreunde, um, which is on Lake Constance um, that goes from a town, uh, I'm gonna get this wrong, uh, so bear with it, from a town in Austria to a town in Switzerland. Um, and there's a, a statue of the Virgin Mary that gets carried from one church to the other every time the lake freezes over or and when it's safe to walk across. And I have no idea how you determine whether it's safe to walk across the lake with this statue. Um, they keep track, they have records back to like the 1100s of how many years per century this, this bust of this, the Virgin Mary has been moved from one, one church to the other. Um, there are similar rituals, um, Shinto rituals in Japan um, on Lake Suwa um, having to do with formation of ice ridges. And so there are a lot of, of really interesting places where ice formation on lakes and rivers and canals in this case um, has this sort of cultural resonance. Um, to say nothing of parking trucks out on the lake and seeing when they fall through, which is a um, uniquely American thing. Um, okay. Um, LIDAR, light. Yeah, so uh, Fox, that's a great question. And we do have, um, I have one in my lab that I've, we have acoustic instruments. Um, are we wrapping this up at 10 or can I go past 10? I don't think anyone, uh, I don't think we have any MPCA police that kick us off at 10 yeah, o'clock. I, I should let, people are free to obviously bug off. I can't tell anyway, um, but I will sit here and keep answering questions because answering questions is my favorite part of giving talks. Um, so Fox really quickly, um, we have acoustic instruments that we put under the ice um, that can measure the distance to the ice surface or the bottom of the ice. Um, I've had one out a few times. I've managed to deploy it only in ice-free years. Um, and so I've not been particularly lucky. There's a group at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, which is NOAA's big Great Lakes lab in Ann Arbor. They've had some success in Lake Erie. Um, it turns out to just be really logistically difficult to do. Um, and so, there isn't a lot of, of there's there's no there's certainly no long term records with these. Um, but the group at Glural and my group have made some attempts at utilizing these um, to to measure ice thickness. Um, from Brook from QA, a comment slide with the graphic showing lake square ice covering 2012 and 20 counterintuitive. Oh yeah, Brook, I apologize for that. And so. Brooke 
makes a very good point in that the color scheme that the National Ice Center uses to make those maps is the opposite of what you might want. Um, in that white represents completely ice free and red or gray for whatever reason represents um, ice coverage. I've recently found the raw data for that and have downloaded the last 50 years and I'm going to start making my own maps. So thanks, Brooke. I'm going to, I'll have better maps, more intuitive color, uh, uh, color bar uh, for those maps in the future. But yes, um, they do sort of have it backwards. So, um, raise this point from look over my shoulder. Could not hear the presentation. Just practice. The, yeah. Um, the other thing that I've had pointed out recently is that color is not always the best medium uh, to um, to convey information because people um, have different levels of color um, color perception. And so I'm trying for some of the work that I do to move away um, and use different cues um, to indicate. Uh, indicate trends or, or, or whatever. So, um, and I have come to the bottom of the Q and A. Um, people are also welcome to turn their cameras on. And it's again, I, I always find these online things um, a little difficult to judge your audience. But um, I appreciate uh, people who have hung on uh, all the way to the end of the hour here. So, um, Jay, I have a I have a question for you. If sure, if great. People are thinking of other things to stump you with, and it's going to reflect my deep ignorance in the subject. Um, I've always kind of wondered if the long-term warming of Superior is, you know, to what extent it's due to the, to the warm runoff in our rivers and streams, tributaries into the lake, versus the, the warmth that's gained from air temperature and um, solar radiation. And I know you, you spent a, long, a lot of time talking about the ice cover being directly correlated to the air temp, which is fascinating. But I'm kind of wondering about that, that long-term, and what accounts for maybe the, the um, much faster rate of Lake Superior warming than, than elsewhere. Do you think that's due to just the ambient temperatures or is that, is that tributary? function as well or to what extent are we looking at both that's a great question i think in lake superior the answer is pretty definitively that the runoff doesn't play a huge role and it's largely just because of the volume of the lake um lake superior has a as a residence time of something like 200 years which means that the water that flows into lake superior on a yearly basis um is about one half of one percent of the total volume of the lake um and so there's just not enough runoff to play a role in affecting the temperature of the lake. Um, I think that that answer might not be true if you're looking at a small lake where the riverine input is significant compared to the volume of the lake. Um, in that case, it may be more a function of what's going on upstream of the lake. But for Superior, um, the fact that we see these strong connections between air temperature um, and you know we 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 sat down and done the budgets and stuff like that for this, and um, it's it's pretty definitively that surface forcing of that of that relatively warmer air um, leading to the warming that we see. I don't spend enough time thinking about rivers and rivering rivering and rivering input. But I expect that I, I was mentioning Mark to you earlier that we're going to be doing some work doing particle tracking in the Western Arm of Lake Superior uh, this summer um, in conjunction with the Wisconsin DNR. I expect I'll know a lot more about rivering input um, by the end of the summer. Further questions? Well, absolutely fascinating talk. And um, I think you can judge by the, we had a great turnout and uh, you know, obviously touching on uh, something that people are greatly interested in um, thanks so much for um, giving us a talk on this really interesting topic. Well, again, I always appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk about this sort of stuff. So, great. Um, and yes, one more person from, yes. So, Kristen, you, you heard the same thing twice then. Um, some, some repeat from the Noms talk, but some new stuff as well, I think. So. Great. Um, again, thank you very much. 
Um, and again, if people are interested, I would love to have a discussion with the MPCA about um, a stronger interaction with the water resources science program and with our with our practical course in particular. If you have challenges that um, you know some sharp graduate students should be set loose on, um, we're really interested in having that discussion. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much again, Jay, for uh, joining us. I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. Sure. Is there a way I can save the chat? Um, do you know?